Hello, welcome to Relatable On The Go. This is your host, Teresa Freeman. On The Go provides real advice and real insight from real industry experts in just 15 minutes or less. Enjoy this episode and please click subscribe so you can have access to our latest content. And as always, be sure to stay connected. In this episode of On The Go, you will hear highlights of my interview with Deborah Miskell and Dr. Adam Naylor of Deloitte. There's so much great information in the longer form interview. To listen, please search up my podcast, Relatable, and you can find it on your favorite streaming platform. Tell us about your role at Deloitte. So I am the newly appointed Chief Mental Health Officer at Deloitte. And um, I've been here almost 10 years now and have evolved a somewhat amorphous role to one with more structure and formality. Uh, it's taken a lot of uh, time to get here, but we run a psychological services division that's quite comprehensive, deep in expertise and knowledge with a big internal team. And I think it speaks to the firm's commitment to psychological health and what that brings. But I think in, in, in terms of innovation and forward thinking, one of the things that we really wanted to do was respond to some gaps in your kind of routine way of dealing with psychology and organizations, which tends to default to an EAP. I don't know how we count. I've either been at the firm for one year or about five, because as you <laughs> heard, Deborah reached out to me five years ago. And my official title is I lead, I'm the leader of performance psychology for Deloitte. What really happened, again, it was about five years ago, and Deborah says it well. I remember it was summer. I was sitting at my Boston University office um, where my, my family jokes. I had two full-time jobs. I had a vibrant sports psychology practice serving athletes around the globe at that point, and I was on faculty teaching people how to do what I do, which I loved. And Deborah called up and she said, hi, I'm Deborah Miskell. I'm from Deloitte. I've, I don't know, I've... I've dug you up online. This was like before <laughs> Troll you. And everything. Yes. Yeah, so I don't even want to know, like she'd done something. And then she said, I, I think Deloitte needs someone like you and our leaders in particular. She said, I believe the space you exist in understands stress and complexity. And I was like, bing, bing, bing. That, that is what I operate in. That is this preventative space, this help people's through transition space that I live in. I said, oh, that's kind of interesting. You know, I, I think, I think Deborah has some sort of interesting idea because I think we can have a really strong psychologically grounded approach to these things in a corporate space. That's also integrated, right? That's truly married to the clinical side as well. Because oftentimes that doesn't happen, right? You have your L and D that that talks kind of here are the ideas that you should learn from the human side, and there's our EAP or our psychology. And Deborah right. said, "How do we integrate this so we serve our people better? In my area, at first, the leaders better, so they can thrive as humans, but also lead and drive business better. So that's really kind of where I sit in the initial vision. How do I do? How are you integrating psychological services into the wellness program at Deloitte?" up to as, as um, Adam was talking about was we wanted to make the science of psychology relatable to everybody. It's so over pathologized and over medicalized. Not that we're not going to ignore at all, acknowledge and validate the clinical side of things, but we sort of drifted into this space where nobody sees psychology as relatable unless you're in the ditch or in the crisis or it's super, super serious mental illness. We, we, we attend that better than anybody, but we also wanted to take um, the, the open up the aperture, if you will, and say there's something for everybody from, you know, across the, the spectrum of human experience, because it, it, people, we've, we're finding highly stigmatized, right? And people weren't relating to it if they weren't having that experience in the moment. So we just were, were kind of sitting off to the side. So now we've, we've really opened up that view and are inviting everybody in wherever they're at in a very validating and professional way and giving something for everybody. Deborah, what was your unique path to Deloitte? I was like in criminal psychology. And from as, as long as I can remember, I was fascinated by crime. 
and the kind of psychological factors that led somebody to do certain types of act in certain ways. And so um, I legit was going to be the next Clarice Starling. I mean, I was on that, you know, back in the day, it was not uh, as, as um, a, a clear path as it is now. So I was trying to piece together many, many years ago, a pathway to get enough clinical forensic psychology, sort of police psychology, investigative psychology, if you will, to piece together enough education training experience to get me into the, you know, kind of law enforcement and, you know, profiling behavioral sciences on the criminal side and was was well on my way. I, my career started out in the U.S. Department of Justice, and um, this this wasn't even a thought on my radar. And had a, you know, just kind of a family pivot. I literally had um, been offered a job with the FBI, gone through a, a year long top secret clearance, got a start date and had, a, had to pivot. And I don't regret the pivot because um, it was necessary for my family, but you know, everything for a reason, right? And, and so I legit was just starting to go, I've got to make this pivot, got into man management consulting, um, and found it kind of interesting and um, started to make relationships with marquee clients, you know, your professional services firms, banks, et cetera. And I met a guy and that guy was a mentor and a friend and somebody very, very near and dear to me. And he had this kind of cool job, kind of like mine. And I remember kind of thinking like, how do you, how do you get to that path? Because it's, it's an unusual path. It's not one that's, um, there aren't a lot of opportunities in that space, in part because people don't think about the importance of it internally, what they like Deloitte does. And we got to talking a lot, very much like our relationship, got to know each other really well. And um, I was sort of, um, Deloitte was the client, I was the consultant. And I asked him a question because we were really good friends. And I said, how did you get where you were? How did you get where you, you, know, you, you ended up? And he told me, all good things to those who wait. And I was kind of stymied by the response and probably felt like he was giving me a boundary saying, probably don't, you know, maybe that's not the appropriate question to ask in a client consultant relationship. But he had already been thinking about bringing me into the firm. And um, he knew I sort of got what the firm was needing and he was going to be retiring on his way out. And, um, you know, as all this was, was kind of coalescing decisions about law enforcement and, and the FBI versus this. Deloitte ended up making an offer I couldn't refuse. It was just personally um, best for me. And they were going to allow me to pursue my passions in that space because there are a lot of forensic things that actually happen in a firm like ours. And so the, yeah. it sounds like an odd combination, but it, it's actually worth its weight in gold. Yeah. And so it was really um, a little bit of serendipity being open to opportunity, but also being bold enough to ask. What are the common pain points among leaders and how are you helping? When I was talking to Deborah in that first call and she talked about stress and complexity, I was like, that's a psychological factor. How do we help someone navigate stress and complexity so we smooth it out a little bit? You know, how do we communicate better with one another? Humans existing with humans is an emotional experience for better, worse, and indifferent. We're not going to take the human experience away from life, but can we smooth it out and upskill, I think is really important. The other, I think, quick note I'll put to your question, yeah. my resource is used really well during transition points. And if we know it, anyone that dives into the psychological literature knows transitions in life, whether it's college to a job, whether it's from you know middle age to old age, you name it, tends to take three to five years and is stressful. That's normal. So we try and speed it up a little bit, but we also try and go, guess what? Let's navigate this normal, healthy human stress in a distinctively Deloitte way so we can keep thriving together a little bit better. So I think pain point is, a, I love it and I hate it, right? Yeah. Because yeah. I want people showing up going, well, I'm broken. Yeah. And we're blessed that we have really forward thinking leaders that are like, no, no, we just want to use this because it will make us better leaders better humans for us and our families, maybe prevent a few clinical things, but also maybe even open the door so people can get there a little bit better with that integration piece. Sometimes it's like, Adam, I know you understand this stuff. And I'll be like, I do. And you actually want to talk to Deborah. So that's that integrated piece. Yeah. That 
it does not exist many places, frankly, right. which is really cool. Leaders um, are highly underserved um, and fall well under, you know, just typical utilization in terms of accessing services because they feel like they have a target on their back. And um, and then add to that, the, having a knowledge of the, the special nuances, you know, the population as a whole, our high performance, you know, professional services firm, same prevalence rates with, you know, things going on as everybody else. Uh, they're, they're, it took a little bit of time to socialize that this isn't a rarefied a atmosphere where things don't happen. So, we Dr. Naylor, how did you grow your sports psychologist practice? Wow, that's a great question. It almost feels like reflecting on a, a 30 year career <laughs> right here. Um, I, and I've been thinking about this a fair amount lately. I, I know I was, I was asked the other day if I'll sit on a conference panel about um, failures and what you learned. And, and I actually struggled with that question because my career has been one of constant iteration, if you will, right? Like, I don't think my job is to judge if I'm a success or failure. Someone else can, that, that, that's on them but it's been a constant iterating and trying to add depth. So it's really interesting. You actually mentioned the corporate athlete and Jim Lair. That's actually part of the way I got into the field because Jim Lair was huge in sports psychology who created the corporate athlete in the eighties. The corporate athlete was basically created in the nineties. So I've always been like, how do you learn, add depth and look to the next step, mm -hmm. right? So it's been this real geekiness and Deborah knows that about me. I, I might be the biggest geek in this space possible. You know, for a decade, I read all the performance psychology literature. Now I read almost all social psychology and cognitive psychology. I'm like, okay, what's next? So I think there was this building of depth and that was critical or Deborah would have never, you know, spoken to me past a month or two, because mm -hmm. as she said, that depth of knowledge, if you're coming into a space of psychology where you're expected to be an expert and build trust, mm -hmm. you, you better have both depth and hopefully breath as well, because in this day and age of psychology, someone can sniff out the hashtag pretty quick. Let's talk about soft skills, please. Because I got two that are ringing in my head. Okay. One, invitation. You know, this idea of being inviting, right? Inviting to all in the meeting, inviting, because A, I think you want to hear those ideas so you can make those iterations. A, the more inviting one is, the more you get this energy to thrive together, right? You build these quality connections we talk about. You know, I, I, um, I always say, I hope we're laying out a welcome mat if we want to have great teams, right? So the invitation is so, and I like thinking of it that way. Everyone goes, team, what? this and that, invitation, because it's something I know how to do. I love it. Acceptance is my other one. It's a mm -hmm. big psych term and ruthless acceptance. And acceptance is not the same as contentment. I've told that to all my high performers over the years. I can be irritated that I didn't get what I want, but if I can accept it and keep my feet moving, I'm more likely to get there. So truly understanding what acceptance is, I think is a really powerful place, right? It lets us in this non-judgmental space that keeps our feet moving, allows us to have useful emotions. So authentic yeah. investment and engagement and flexibility in who's around you, right? Because, you know, Adam, it's kind of like a piggyback on the invitation. You just never know where something cool is going to happen between um, people. And I think, again, that curiosity to invest and ripple out around pe people that you just never know what's going to enrich. And, mm -hmm. But it, 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 not in a dismissive way, though. I mean, there actually has to be, you know, we talk about active listening and all that stuff. But there has to be emotional commitment to the relationship. And mm -hmm. it, not just a one and done. There actually has to be active pursuit and involvement mm -hmm. in a, a wide range of experiences around you because you just never know where something cool is going to happen. Yeah. All right. And, and what about that advice to your younger self? Yeah, I find that a really tough question, as you won't be surprised. I feel really fortunate. I, I feel blessed with every single, in, every single step on my professional path so far. Um, I think I'd probably go to the be accepting and patient early in the career. Right. It's uh, and I think I was OK at it, but that's really critical. You know, I I think I was pretty good in my 20s. I was definitely better in my 30s. And, and I hope Deloitte's really pleased with what they're getting right now. Yeah. You know, so, you know, I, I think patience and. Yeah. Exactly. OK. And Deborah, for you. So I, I'll, I'll probably give you two. So one that I knew then and I continue to, to deploy today is 
I trust myself to know, even in the, in the space of heat or disagreement, disapp I, I sort of always was like, this. I'm getting feedback or suggestions or whatever, but I could sort through and trust with confidence. I know what, what I'm doing and where I'm going. I don't have a lot of anxiety about that. I haven't suffered a lot with, with that. So trusting myself to know where the path is going to, you know, I, I'm going to do okay either way. And I trust my decisions. But I think something that I've learned along the way is to keep um, open and flexible to what's ahead. While I was thinking Flurry Starling, it, it, it narrowed my view a little bit to other things. And I was forced by circumstance to open the view with great result. So you just never know. And instead of interpreting that anxiously, it's like, there's some badass things out there that you didn't even know were on the horizon. Yeah. And, um, and look at me now. So without that flexibility and, and adhering rigidly to some kind of idea of what point A to point B looks like, enjoy the ride and you never know where you'll end up. Key takeaways for this episode include serendipity, be open to opportunity, but bold enough to ask. Be able to pivot. Everything happens for a reason. Invest in and trust yourself. Practice ruthless acceptance. Be a pioneer and take time to build quality relationships. Thank you to Deborah and Dr. Naylor and to our audience for watching or listening to this episode of On The Go. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, TFA Soft Skills. If you want to hear this interview in its entirety, visit tfasoftskills.com or your favorite streaming platform to listen to this conversation or any of our relatable podcast episodes. Until next time, this is Teresa Freeman with Relatable On The Go. Stay connected.